And how's everyone doing on this Monday? The weather is beautiful. All those in Illinois know this to be true. Had the fat boy out today and she was running hell, man. She's like a raped ape, man. Let me tell you. Today we are going to talk a little bit about Twin Peaks and we have uh, a guest coming on, a special one. Uh, his name is Richard Luther and he was there at Twin Peaks that day on Mar or, or May 15th of 2015 and he is one of the last of the 24 that just had his charges dropped against him and i know a lot of the fellows down in texas right now are feeling real good about that uh but we shouldn't have had a go through all that you know these people went through hell these last four years because of one person and his name was Abel Reyna and this guy I hope to hell people sue this guy into the dark ages the dark ages what a dick anyway uh, that's gonna be the show we're also gonna have uh, Tombstone coming up uh, later on in the show giving his uh, thoughts on everything that went down in uh, Waco Texas and uh, also, this week, Saturday, we will be having Big O from the Kazakh One Percenters come on. He was also another one of those that lost, uh, just got uh, his charges uh, dropped. So, a lot of stuff coming up. Uh, actually, uh, Thursday on Ask Hollywood, I tackle a question uh, about border, con uh, border uh, patrol agents, if they're considered to be actually cops and stuff like that and i addressed that right there from sugar river we shot that video today so anyway actually how is everyone doing today in the chat room over on youtube i cannot see you guys over on the other platforms we just added five different platforms man we're over in japan now we're at every uh corner of the world so hey how'd you guys think uh china did on her thing yesterday you guys got to give her a little break she has got to get used to it uh so i think she'll do a lot better and i told her hey you got to start getting you know a 20 minute thing going there for us man but uh anyway also if you have not voted yet for good time charlie to be in the hall of fame from bic Get on over there at the Sturgis Hall of Fame and submit a nomination on his behalf. If you need the address put on there, go ahead and contact me and I will get it to you. But uh, just to give a little background before I get Richard on the phone of what happened down there, uh, this is a lot of the stuff that's been said in the past week. And you find, if I find it funny anyway, that the mainstream media is having a big hard on because nobody got charged, everybody got let go. Well, where have you been the last four years? Where have you been as these people have went through hell and back? You haven't reported a thing. Not one thing. And just like I said on Saturday, I even went to, you know, that fake Chris Cox over at Bikers for Trump and said, hey, man, you got the ear to the president. Why in the heck? Haven't you talked about Waco? Why? Because it's not in your interest, you're not a biker, and you don't like motorcycle clubs. But that is the mainstream media for you. They talk and talk and talk and talk. They act so surprised, and it's quite literally disgusting. It's kind of like their coverage of that Russian uh, hoax with the President of the United States. But here's uh, you know one good article that I actually found that uh, came out good in this. And this guy actually did a little research into this, and his name is Connor. And I forgot what newspaper he was from because I only got a couple of the quotes from the, the story. But he talks about how roughly uh, 200 bikers were arrested on May 17th of 2015. Now, you got to remember, these people were just arrested out of the blue. Okay, they gave these people, uh, thanks for that, uh, Tom. I really appreciate the. Uh, the super chats that uh, comes in handy and all that good stuff. But uh, actually, you know, I cannot, what they had, I got backtracked there. What they had was a blank sheet of paper. They put the people's name on. Next thing you know, you're getting hauled ass into jail. That was our uh, justice system on May 25th, of tw or no, not May 25th, May uh, 15th. I got an event in my head that I just got invited to, but on May 15th of 2015, that's how justice worked. They were Gestapo. They went in the whole nine yards. Four of the people that were killed were killed by 223s. 
those were the cops they even talk about it in this uh, article and uh, the former district attorney uh, Abel Reyna bears much of the blame now even the news media is starting to come out and say hey it was this guy who did it you know the official narrative laid responsibility for the massacre wholly on the bikers but the Associated Press now the AP is, you know, it's pretty big out. It's one of the biggest, that and Reuters. We actually get uh, a lot of our articles from the AP. Later found out that police at the scene shot at least four of them. So they know that they shot at least four bikers. And from what I'm understanding from some of the people that I talk to is if you look like you're a threat to a cop or you're, you're pulling a pistol or something, you got shot. Uh, Actually, then he goes into appeal, has a good summary of what happened. Police arrested some who were hiding in the bathroom during the fight and three bikers who arrived after the shooting was over. Uh, a federal lawsuit later alleged that Reyna had ordered the mass arrest, that's the thing I was talking about, and prepared a cookie cutter affidavit. Remember? He just had to sign that name. Regardless of the evidence against the individual bikers, a justice of peace came in, set one million dollar bond for every single arrest e to send a message in his words. Many were stuck in uh, a jail for weeks. They didn't have any access to attorneys. Uh, Reina's office ultimately pursued charges against more than 150 under the argument that even individuals, here's his argument, who weren't involved in the fight were guilty by their attendance alone. They were just guilty because they were there. They didn't do nothing wrong, but because they attended a confederation meeting, which is a peaceful meeting, they were charged. <laughs> Can you believe that? They were charged for going to assemble. I thought that last time I checked, that is a constitutional right. You have a right to assemble. But here Reyna is, he charged them and sent a message just because they were there. They had Christian clubs being arrested. They had vet clubs being arrested that day. It was nuts. Uh, more than 100 bikers have since sued Waco for wrongful arrest. You think? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Their cases could cost the city more than a billion dollars. A billion. With that be. I hope you guys sue them into the dark ages. I wish they won't have nothing to spend on roads or anything for the next 50 to 100 years for after what they did to you guys. A billion dollars. That's a good number. But, you know, five or six billion for what they've done. Prosecutors were caught repeatedly withholding evidence, and you've seen that in some of my videos where Casey at Jake's trial was actually complaining about that they were withholding evidence after evidence after evidence. Yes, that is the Justice Department here in the United States now. It is. Sad stuff, sad stuff. Uh, a Texas Ranger, and this is another thing that he put in the article, and I'm going to get on and call uh, Richard in a second. A Texas Ranger relayed that Reyna has specifically instructed him to keep evidence away from the defense team. Now, I don't know if you guys know the, you know, these Texas Rangers and stuff, but they're pretty high up there, man. They don't they don't play around, man. Hey, Chuck Norris played a Texas Ranger in Lone Wolf McQuaid, and he didn't do no. Uh-uh. They were straight up mean, and they know what they're doing. And this guy went on record and said Abel Reyna did this. Now, that is the lead up with Richard. Now, Richard was there that day. He's seen it. He actually had a give medical attention to the one of the, his brothers that died. And it's a sad story uh, what him and his uh, wife had to go through, just like everybody else. But uh, let's give him a call and let's get him online real quick. How's everybody doing out there? Man, I'm so glad to be able to ride again. Rich. Richard, how you doing? It's Hollywood. You're on the Madhouse, my man. 
Oh, right on, Hollywood. Good to hear from you, my friend. Oh, man, it's even better to hear from you, man. You had that scare, man. You scared the shit out of me with that health, man. I'm glad you're doing better. Dude, you know, that was just the weirdest thing, you know, uh, having a hard time breathing, and Danielle said, fuck this, I'm calling the, uh, an ambulance. Next thing I know, I'm in Tyler, uh, and that's the last I remember. Uh, they put me on life support and tell Danielle, you know, when they turned me off, you know, what's her decision, you know. I, it, it was incredible, you know. Um, and I just came back, and uh, when they disconnected uh, and pulled the tubes and everything, and I was just, uh, just happening. God is on my side, brother. Rock on, man. The old man upstairs took uh, care of you and stuff. That is, uh, yeah, but you scared the shit out of me, man. <laughs> scared the shit out of everybody, man. I I didn't mean to fuck anybody up like that. <laughs> right. Well, you know, I gave the lead up uh, to uh, what happened at Texas. You know, all the stuff that you had to, you know, endure. I cannot imagine what you and Danielle had to go through. You know, as it was going through, and you know, we were keeping, you know, a lot of quiet. It, my heart fell for you guys. How did you make it through this four-year-old ordeal with what they did to you? I had a hard time hearing you there, Hollywood. Oh, you had a hard time? Are you on speaker or no? No, I am. You want me to take it off speaker? Yeah, take it off speaker. It'll be easier for you to hear me because we're on the radio and that's the way it, it's just. All right. <laughs> All right. There, there you go, brother. Sound a lot better? I can hear you a little better. Yes, sir. All right, rock on. Awesome. Now, uh, you know, just like uh, I said, uh, you know, when you couldn't hear me, how did you guys, how were you able to make it through what they did to you for the last four years? Man, the last four years, dude, has just been like the weight of the world on your shoulders, you know, like in the back of your subconscious, you know, it's always there, you know, and, and you don't know what's going to happen. And, and, you know, people say, oh, don't worry, they can't do anything. But, you know, look what this dickhead did. Man, he crushed hundreds of lives. We're not just talking about the individuals, bikers involved. We're talking about their wives, their children, their homes, their families. You know, I mean, it just, uh, the last four years has been has been hell. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, uh, I, I got out of jail after 33 days. And, and first thing I told Danielle is give me a home brewed cup of coffee and Give me a pack of cigarettes. Right. Now, <laughs> you, know? you, you were actually, you were being held for, you got, you ha got held for what, 30 days after this? Yes. Man. And uh, one of the reasons was, you know, what they claimed that you did was when you stood up while everybody else was taking a piss and stuff like that and sat back down, uh, that the brass knuckles that you were sitting by were yours. And that's when the cops started uh, going at you. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when they they arrested me before they took everybody else down to the convention center. Mm -hmm. So I went I went directly to jail and did not pass go, mm -hmm. and definitely did not collect two hundred dollars. <laughs> right, right. Now you know, I, like I said uh, in the introduction and stuff like that. There was a whole t a whole sphere of different clubs there. You had Christian clubs, uh, veterans clubs, for what I heard, and they just went in and swooped everybody up. Yeah, I did. I mean, uh, before, um, when I first got there, I went around with my regional sergeant of arms, you know, and we were talking to some of the vets and some of the Christian clubs and, you know, uh, the booze fighters and... And uh, just just a whole slew of different um, uh, venue or uh, you know plethora of clubs, shaking hands and just talking and, and and having a pretty good time. Actually, everybody was very very easygoing and friendly, and this you know it wasn't like uh, uh, you know they were all leery or anything like that. You know, right, right. Now you know I, I was you, you seen some horrific stuff that day. And one of the big things, and it looks like the media is actually, the mainstream media is starting to uh, question what happened that day with the cops, where four of your brothers were killed by 223s. And now the media is finally stepping up and saying, hey, this doesn't sound right. 
You know, what do you think took them so long to stay involved in this? You know, if they wanted a story, they want they had it right here of the worst police misconduct this pr country's probably ever seen. Brother, it was so set up from the word go. It wasn't about the banditos and the Cossacks. Yes, they have their differences. Yes, sir, they do. But to meet up in a public place like that and start shooting each other, no, sir. No, sir. Mm -hmm. You know, when the police were there at 7 a.m. setting up pole cameras and placing their snipers on top of Don Carlos and Don Carlos patio and up on the knoll that separated, you know, that shopping center from the highway from 35. Mm -hmm. No, sir. They were, the, you, you know, it was to send, uh, you know, uh, uh, police go to uh, uh, the president of the Waco chapter and say, hey, you guys, you know, this is like in April. You know, you guys really need to come to this thing and meet and, you know, and settle your differences, you know, and get things worked out. Mm -hmm. You know, at this COC and I, and I meeting, uh, if I knew one tenth then what I know now, I wouldn't have gone. Right. And I, I you know what? I, and I, I know you to be the truest, most honest person out there. You know, my question is, Richard. Why did the Nationals even allow you, you know, I know you can't talk club business and stuff like that, but on the outside looking in, how did they even allow this to happen? Why did they, you know, let the Cossacks go there knowing that this was a cop setup? Because on the outside, I would have seen it, you know, hey, you know, you need, you need, you guys need to go out there. You need to settle your differences. And there was taxes back and forth. You know, it, it just kind of, it, it seems kind of, uh, how can I say it, uh, screwed up is the best I can come up with right there. Oh, no, yeah, it. yeah, it, it was definitely a quagmire, man. I mean, you know, um, there's so many theories out there, and of course, like I said, I, you know, if I knew one-tenth of then what I know now, um, you know, a shot was uh, fired off into the ground to get everything started. That bullet's still in the ground to this day. They couldn't even pressure wash it out. They tried prying it out. It stuck in the ground. Now, uh, you know, now you're talking about a bullet that, uh, shot into the ground that started it all. Who did it come from? That's, that's, yes, that's, you know, I, I believe that 100%. Mm -hmm. now, do, you know that 100%. If it, do you know if it was from the bikers or from the cops? Uh, well, I think it, it was uh, an inside informant. I don't know which, which club, you know. I'm not... I, like I said, from the very beginning, you know, Hollywood, baby, this isn't about clubs. This is about profiling. This is about one, uh, you know, uh, a district attorney that thought he could make a big, huge crash on two major clubs and, and become, uh, you know, governor. Right. This was somebody that had a political ambition who thought that he, could, no matter if he destroyed hundreds of people, that he could make happen. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's really what this boils down to. Well, exactly. And that's, it, and that's where everybody's missing it. That's where everybody's missing it, you know. Hey, man, you know, everybody can work out their differences uh, one way or another, but everybody's going to have to come together because the government and the setups and the political people, you know, can uh, just burn circles around you if, you, if you if you keep on, you know, being at war with each other. Mm -hmm. So at some point, regardless if you're a one percent club or if you're, you know, a mom and pop club or whatever, everybody's got to come together and say, "I'm not going to be profiled, right? And you're right. not going to take my weapons from me, and you're not going to stop me from wearing my colors. You know what I mean? You're not going to stop me from rolling down the road. Mm -hmm. You're yeah. not going to pull me over every time I'm in my colors and search me. That's profiling, mm -hmm. and that's what we've got to fight now. Now that this bird has been lifted off me, brother, and I feel, oh, trust me. I feel like the world's been lifted off my shoulders. Man, I can But it's imagine. also pissed me off. Right. Well, it's actually got really bad down in Texas with the profile, and these guys are like freaking, you know, Johnny Quest on any kind of mission they can do. They're going after a biker with the colors now. It is nuts down there from what we're hearing up here. It is, you know. In, in, in Colleen, Texas, last night, there were two bike clubs that had a run-in, um, two people were injured. One person's critical and may die. 
Um, and they didn't even mention what clubs they were uh, or whatever. You know, they were just sensationalizing motorcycle games. Right, right. Exactly. You know? Well, we know which uh, clubs were involved. Uh, actually, Black Dragon's covering that because uh, me, you know, I'm not going to give them the pricks of satisfaction in mainstream media to let it out there uh, or the cops. But uh, you, you're so right. Club, you know, after Waco, I think we've seen a turn in the club scene where, hey, guys, you know, you might not want to take showers to the wee hours of the morning together, but stop freaking uh, all the stuff because the feds, the cops, they got enough. And this was shown in Waco. They got the money. They got the time to make your life miserable. And it's hard to beat the government. It, 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 no doubt about it. There's mm. no doubt about it. Right. And right, they did make life just as miserable as possible. Oh, man, I cannot imagine what you and Danielle went through. Oh, my God, Jesus. You know what? You're, just, you're one of the strongest persons I know that went through something like this. And, you know, one of the happy things, you know, that came out of it, and I guess, you know, from a point of view from the outside, is that nobody ratted on each other from the Kazakhs. You know, from my understanding, nobody took deals or any of that kind of shit. I hear you, bro. I mean, I know that's right. Mm -hmm. um, and there again, you know, we really have to have a, a, a come to Jesus meeting with all the bikers, even if they're not in a club. Uh, uh, and, and work maybe with uh, Double D or some of these people that are out there trying to get legislation changed. Right. Trying to get, you know, this thing done legally. So that we can ride free uh, American people. Mm. Because what happened on, on, on May uh, 17, 2015, was the cops were shooting indiscriminately at American citizens. Mm -hmm. Like a Gestapo. You know, uh, you know, earlier I said, you know, I can't imagine, you have to have PTSD or something. because You know, they say four people were killed by the police, but, you know... Uh, uh, Richard Kirshner, a personal friend of mine. I mean, I love him with all my heart. He was my brother. In or out of rags, he was in my brother. He was my brother. And I sat there and held his hand and, and while he bled out. Until they told me to get on the ground or they were going to blow my brains out. And the cops just sat there and let it happen. You know what? That And, that and they're saying that crazy. some biker shot him. No, 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 no. No, I, I'm sitting right there. Mm. And from the time that Bear went down and we got to move him, and it's all on video, and he laid next to that minivan there over in Don Carlos' parking lot was 22 minutes. Oh, my God. 22 minutes. <laughs> 22 minutes. They let my brother sit there and bleed. Man. Now, they're talking about uh, Jesus Christ. Christ, 22 minutes. Uh, now, was that Waco, or was it was ATF there, or, you know, what cops were there doing this? Yeah, that was, that. well, that, ATF was there, FBI was there, Waco PD was there, DPS was there, SWAT was there. Um, I'm not, not including the informants uh, in, in both clubs. Mm-hmm. But uh, that was Waco, and, and we're talking about Bear, right? Uh, who I was mentioning, right? Right, and that's one you can see right there in the video. Uh, you can see a lot of it, and, and, I, and I and I say things like that because I, I want a shock sensation. You know, I do want bikers to wake up and, and realize that that we're being harassed because we're being profiled. Mm -hmm. You're rolling on two wheels. You must be armed, and you must be a criminal. Right. Right. You know, and um, and you're perfectly you're, down, you're perfectly right. Down and right. You're per I'm sorry. You're perfectly right. There needs to be a shock value. People need to hear about what happened that day. They have to. People were getting shot like it was a turkey shoot, and our government went in there like a damn Gestapo out of 1938 and arrested American citizens without investigation and without proof of crime. So, yeah, you're damn right, Richard. I support you 100%, man. Yes, sir. Well, but you know what? Um, 
My next court date was actually set on the fourth anniversary on May 17, 2019. It was actually my next court date. And uh, what was it, two, day, two days ago, baby? Two days ago. Well, I've got the, a text message with uh, three days ago, um, you know, that uh, all charges have been dropped. And that was... Uh, that was like a, the weight of the world lifted off my shoulders, brother. Mm-hmm. I, I can't you know, imagine. It was like life beginning all again because we'd been through so much right. um, stress and and, uh, and and grief, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Now, you know, you actually were caught on video where the cop was pushing it towards you. And I cannot believe that, you know... You know, thank God, Barry Johnson and all that stuff. You know, he dropped the cases and stuff like that. But why they didn't see the cop doing that to you? They knew it wasn't yours, but still they dragged you to the last 24. Yeah, that's right, man. You know, well, and prior to that, we were all sitting on that curb there at Don Carlos, and everybody was complaining, man, I got to take a whiz, I got to take a whiz, I got to take a whiz. So finally, they let everybody need to take a whiz, step on that grassy knoll, which on the other side of it is the freeway. And so everybody shifted positions, and I come back, and I sit down. And, you know, this cop goes, hey, what is this right here? You know, and he jerks me around. And I said, dude, I don't know. You know, I just sat back down here. <laughs> right. And that's when I got arrested. Man. And, uh, and I see the picture of, of these primitive weapons is what they called it. And uh, they were actually belt buckles. Mm. Oh, my they God. They had the little uh, things sticking out for belt buckles, and they were too deep to be used in a violent confrontation. Right. You know, a good, you friend, know? Of, you know, a good friend of mine was there, too, uh, Mac. And, uh, you know, some of the stuff I've heard from him that went down, and now, you know, hearing the stuff from you and all the others that were there... Uh, it, it, I cannot believe that the Attorney General of the United States uh, hasn't appointed a special prosecutor into this and looking at the police actions. You know, and people wonder why I can't stand cops. I, uh, they always say, why you bash on cops all the time? There's all good ones and there's bad ones. Not to where I'm from in Chicago. And hearing these type of stories of what they did to over 200 people, I just can't get over it. Oh, it is. It's like a clad brotherhood, you know, and it's even worse with judges, mm-hmm. especially in the state of Texas. Man. It's like a fraternal brotherhood, you know. They cover for each other, and that's we've seen that over the last four years, right. Hollywood. And that ain't American to me, you know. <laughs> where are we going as a country where we allow this kind of stuff to happen? You know, the media went out there doing their propaganda with the biker gang violence and stuff. They always pick up the freaking cops. Uh, and and that's why I'm one of the proponents. You know, I'm not in a club or any of that stuff. You know, that's way behind me. I'll never do it again. Uh, just because, you know, the way the, you know, the system is now. Uh, it's not like when I came through it. But I'm always saying, you know, you got to go out there and give your side of the story as a motorcycle club. Because that is going to turn public opinion in your favor. Because let's face it, everybody loves bikers. That's why these media uh, conglomerates go out there and talk about bikers like they do. Because it's popular. It sells. And that is something that clubs are going to have to start taking advantage of. you got to get out there and give your side of the story on, some, on this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's the one thing I liked about Chris with Bikers for Trump. Because because it had a good incantation for bikers. Mm -hmm. You know, gave a good positive message. Right. Well, you know, I kind of uh, kicked him in the balls on Saturday about his positive message, man. He turned out to be... uh, Something many. Uh, <laughs> I didn't mean to throw. I didn't mean to throw a bombshell your way there, but no, that's all right, man. You know, it's a good idea and stuff. You know what they were trying to do, but with that guy, you know, I even seen the messages that were sent to him uh, asking for his help. I I asked him when I interviewed and talked to him off air. Hey, 
You got the president's ear. There's a problem down in Waco. It needs to be looked at. You got the highest guy in the world's ear. Help us out. You claim to be a biker. So what's up? You know, show us what it is. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, so on, on Saturday, come to find out, he was nothing but a big scam artist. <laughs> right. Yeah, we, we we tried to make contact with him, and, and really, it, it, it you know, it, it really boils back down to our original uh, thought here is that we all have to come together. Right. You right. know, to make things happen, and, you know, and we can't be out there for ourselves. Exactly. Uh, on, on, in this two-wheel world. Well, you know, it's not 1970, it's not 1980 or 90 anymore. It, you know, it is so politically correct out there and so different in the club scene in 2019. <clears throat> yeah, evolution's going to have to take place because what happened back in those days I'll never be able to do, you know, now. And now we got a government that is just hot. It is worse now, I've heard from some of the gray beards than it was in the 70s when it comes to profiling. Right, having a hard time hearing you, bro. Oh, okay, you hear me now? Yes, sir, a little better, thank you. Okay, you know, what I was saying is a lot of gray beards are saying it's a lot worse now than it was back in the 70s. Yeah, you know, I believe so, you know. I, I, I believe it's just more publicized now. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I yeah, believe <laughs> that, you know, well, and over time, clubs get bigger, they spread, and, and they, you know, they they have a territory in which they base out of. Right. Um, you know, so I think from the 70s, things have grown and, and matured into what, what they are, be it a 1% club or not. Mm-hmm. Um, I rode with a 1% club for a couple of years there out of Austin. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm talking you know? about the police profile, and it's actually worse than it used to be. Oh, 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 my God, yeah. I'm sorry. You know, it, 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 you know, it used to not be cool to be a biker. Now that it's cool to be a biker, they get even damn worse. And what's one thing I cannot understand is cops and <laughs> riding in clubs and stuff, uh, these law enforcement clubs. Now, were there any of them there uh, that day at Waco? Ice. Ice was a motorcycle Wait. club there? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, repeat it one more time. Was there any uh, law enforcement motorcycle clubs there that day? Uh, I didn't meet any. There could have been. Um, pretty much uh, we were shaking hands with uh, veterans, Christian clubs, um, some beat clubs, mm. uh, mom-and-pop clubs. But I don't remember, like, Iron Order or any LE club. Right, and I bet if uh, they were there, they wouldn't have got uh, messed with either. Well, you know, a lot of people were released at like 3 in the morning. Mm, man. You know, that were originally arrested. So was it only Kazakhs and uh, Ditos that were uh, detained for so long? That, that's correct. Oh, my well, God. Well, it was Cossacks and Scimitars and then uh, Banditos and uh, who was the other club? Well, I'm talking about the Bandito side, the red and gold side. Yeah, but pretty much, you know, our A and B clubs on both sides. Mm, right, man. You know, those are the only ones that that, that really were held. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Now, how's uh, Danielle uh, taking this? You finally get getting, uh, you know, this off you guys' shoulders, able to move on with your lives. Um, she's taking it pretty well, man. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome, man. That is awesome. You know, you have a great old lady there. Not many guys have good old ladies that stick with them, you know, like that. A lot of the guys that uh, actually went through this ordeal lost old ladies. They lost families. Then they lost jobs. Oh, the homes, children, wives, jobs. Hmm. That, that's why I'm hoping you guys all together see these people into the dark ages, man. You know, an article I just read before you came on saying it's going to cost them approximately $1 billion. I hope for the next 100 years they can't do nothing. Yeah, absolutely, bro. Now, do you, uh, now is uh, Abel Reyna being uh, able to be held accountable for this? Is there any investigation into the, the way he handled this case? 
Um, there is. Well, you know, um, the way uh, uh, Johnson was saying, what Barry Johnson was saying was that the way it was handled and the evidence that they have is not enough to get uh, conviction beyond a shadow of a doubt, so they weren't going to pursue any further and they were going to dismiss all charges, which is the document that I got. Right, right. Now, is that, um, that means they can't charge you again, right? If they get a bug up their ass? Um, if, it's, if it's murder, now they can come back. If they, if they found some kind of uh, evidence, solid concrete, something that, that you were a shooter or whatever, they might be able to. It depends on how. I don't know that everybody's dismissal was worded the way mine was. Mm. Right. You know what I mean? Right. I, 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 I doubt uh, that they can come back. Uh, but really, this is my personal thought. I love being a fly on the wall. But the uh, further that Johnson dug into this with his team, the further he saw who was really involved in what really went on. And he decided to kill it. Right. Well, there's no, you know, he didn't want it to come out at trials or any of that, I bet. Oh yeah, and you know it would have too. Oh yeah, you know, uh, you know, even with the only one that they ever tried was Jake, and even Johnson admitted he was a superb defense witness that he'd never be able to go and convict him. Uh, Casey went after them people. You know, you seen the clips of her, and you seen that these uh, people were hiding evidence. They were trying to suppress everything. You even had a Texas Ranger come out and say that uh, Reina didn't want him to give any of the defense anything. That's right. So I don't understand right. why the hell there ain't like an, a special investigator or something to go after Reina since he's out of office now. I, I seriously think he needs to pay. That's corruption. Well, <laughs> yeah, and, and that's why it'd be nice if we could get a, a, a group into legislation and, and get him uh, get an investigation going. Mm -hmm. um, because it's more than that. I mean, there's you know an FBI investigation going on against Abel Lena now. Um, we know of two kilos of cocaine that were delivered to his office and the two guys that were caught with us well, who caught with it was also um, contributed to, to his campaign <laughs> and they, their charges just went away and two and a half kilos of cocaine disappeared you know there's all kinds of documents like that that uh, Raina's previous attorneys that work for him have given sworn testimony to the FBI Man, it sounds like yeah. Chicago down there, man. <laughs> that happens every day here. <laughs> yeah, right. So that goes to my, like our little Chicago. <laughs> man, you know, it's you. You would think yeah. that Waco, after what happened with Koresh and all them at the Branch Davidian compound, that they would have learned their lesson. But now they're, uh, you know, synonymous with two big incidences in this country. Well, you know, the the DA before him was his dad. Mm -hmm. Right now, his dad was a judge, and now he's a retired judge. Mm -hmm. But uh, oh yeah, man! Even, so it's uh, the good good old boy club. You know, I have yeah, a, I have a, I have a question from James Probo. He uh, he says would ask him if they have asked about Freedom of Information Act lawsuits to get their investigations. Um, so many people have tried. Now, with Barry Johnson, there's a good possibility that uh, they'll release the information. You think it'll be blacked out or any of that stuff? Uh, it, could, it could be redacted, depending um, if there's any. Right now, there's no further investigations. Mm -hmm. It's over, so they should be able to release all the information. But, you know, I'm not an attorney. Right. You know, and I don't work at the DA's office, obviously. Well, you know what, uh, you know, so. James, what I'll do, because uh, I got uh, media credentials and stuff, I'll uh, <laughs> go mess with uh, Freedom Information Act out there and see what I can get. Uh, John uh, says uh, uh, the cops accidentally destroyed the ballistic reports. Is that uh, something you heard? Um, that's absolutely right. Not only that, there were 14 officers uh, using uh, either a, a two two three round or um, was it an M eleven M 
another type of assault weapon. Uh, and they only tested three of the uh, weapons that the officers were using, mm -hmm. which was, uh, do you remember the officer's name? Yeah. Uh, we've got all, we've got all, Neil Jackson and uh, one other officer is the only ones that they tested their guns. Oh, my God. They only tested one um, round from uh, a biker because it struck bear in the butt. Mm -hmm. And they're saying that's the round that killed him. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, they, uh, you know, I, I felt like uh, I was cheese in the mousetrap. Right. I bet. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I bet. How long did the shooting actually last, you know, in our final couple minutes? Uh, it, two and a half minutes max. Holy cow. For a lifetime. I can freaking imagine. Two and a half minutes. Yeah, and, but it, it, and it was yeah, nothing. Two and a half but, minutes. The, what, was it uh, machine gun fire? Because there's no damn way, you know, that many rounds got popped off by, you know, nine millimeters. Well, when you got 14 officers shooting, even if it's a uh, single round or uh, semi-automatic, and then you've got a few bikers shooting back because really nobody knew between the clubs. No, nobody knew. Who, uh, you know, I, I, I crawled on my hands and knees, my belly, I crawled into the restaurant and laid down on the ground there, and I didn't know who was shooting at me. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a clue. Right. My God, that's you know, scary stuff and right and there. so everybody was kind of in the same mind, and so there was a lot of pistol fire that was kind of like out of panic, mm. uh, survival, uh, self defense. Well, I'm kind of you know, I'm kind of you know, the cops, ground law. the cops are kind of freaking lucky that the bikers didn't start turning on them and start shooting at them. Yeah, they're well, man. There's so much that's provable. And, I, and here you go. And this goes back to, you know, this, this new DA. I think this is why that uh, he dismissed all these cases. He wants to kill this thing because really what it opens up to is a lot of um, setup. Mm, right. And they don't want it out. You know, the and that's all I got to say because, brother, I've never seen anything like it. You know, uh, like I said, before the shooting started, I'm, I'm walking around with my regional sergeant of arms shaking hands and, and uh, loving, loving these other brothers and just, you know, just having a good time to um, all of a sudden Vietnam. Right, right. You know what I mean? And, and uh, uh, it just doesn't, I've, I've, I've thought about it for four years and we collected uh, information for four years uh, trying to figure this thing out. And um, I would say it's political corruptness. Man, um, just to be mild. You think uh, the governor of Texas, Abbott, or whatever that uh, you know, involved in this, keeping it quiet? Because this is the guy who turns around and says, "Hey, go after every uh, every gang member you can," and he didn't distinguish at all. <laughs> well, you know, I think Abbott's aware of it, um, but you know, we just had an election cycle not too far back here, and uh, he wanted to. You know, he had to his political base, you know, and he didn't want to bring it up because it's it's a sore spot um, on all justice, period. Right, right. Uh, the way that this was done and the constitutional rights that they stepped on, all the cookie-cutter uh, affidavits and um, indictments and, you know, from A to, to Z, Mm -hmm. This thing was uh, just a, a, a circus. Right. Well, I'm hoping uh, during uh, the civil trials that uh, a lot more starts becoming public and a lot of these media outlets and uh, everybody else out there starts keep, keeps this in the public eye. We can't let it go. We got to keep this is just the start. We got to keep fighting. Uh, and that's and we are we are following up civilly. Mm -hmm. um, I like it. I think it'll take about thirty six months. Uh, it's going to be 
a back and forth thing. You know how civil litigation goes. Right, right. But uh, I think there's going to be a, a McLennan County is going to be um, probably offering things out of court, you know, to get rid of some of these things. And uh, people like Abel Reyna, who are, is part of the civil suit and uh, personally getting sued mm. for his actions. Um, I don't know exactly how that's going to work, Hollywood. Uh, uh, but well, my civil attorney's got got it got it all under control. Well, I'm hoping that he's able to dig and dig and dig and uh, a lot more of the actions of the police and uh, Raina come out the light that people don't know about now. And uh, you know that's justice right there. That'd be finally justice for people to actually know what law enforcement and this guy was doing just because of political ambitions. Yeah, and he's very very good at that too. As a matter of fact. Uh, uh, let me see, I guess it'd be more than three and a half years ago, he won a case in McLennan County and was awarded $2.5 million for his client uh, suing law enforcement. Rock on. That's awesome. So, you know, yeah, he knows the, the ins and outs and the loops mm. that he's got to run through. And, you know, he told us straight up, you know, you're looking anywhere from two to five years. Right. You know, the way it's going to get tossed around like a ping pong ball. Right. Right. Well, you know, I, I really appreciate having you on the show, Richard. Uh, you know, as always, love you to death. Uh, you know, man, the stuff you guys went through. Nobody should ever go through, especially an American citizen. Uh, your old lady around? Danielle around? Yeah, she's here. Hey, let me talk. Let me say hi to her. I got to say congratulations to her. All right. Thanks for having me on, bro. We love you, Hollywood. Always, man. I'm always with you. Hello. What's up, honey? Hi. Well, you know what? I just wanted to say on air, congratulations, and you went through a lot. I know you have, and you were right there with Richard. Yeah, I, w I hope uh, more old, you know, more guys out there have old ladies like you. You're a true definition of an old lady, and you know what? That what you did sticking by him for the last four years, you're amazing, honey. Well, I'll tell you what, the one number one reason why uh, he said he was going to change my last name to Luther was because I had his back. Mm -hmm. Man, did you. Man, did you. You know what? You were strong. Yeah, and... I love you. Yeah, I know you <laughs> love me, baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know what? I'm so happy that everything worked out for you guys. And you know what? Keep pushing forward. You know we will. Uh, we'll still give them hell and stuff like that. And you, ju you guys just keep fighting. And if you ever need anything from the show, let me know. You bet. We sure will. It's, it's been a really long haul. And... There's, uh, you know, of course, I'm good at journaling and, you know, so on and so forth. So um, all of that's worth is weight and gold right. uh, when it comes to civil stuff. And um, I guess one of the things that I really wanted to say was I've noticed that um, some people going through this process have not had the opportunity because they've been stuck um, to grieve. And now that they have been released and dismissed, um, the process for grieving and going through that PTSD time. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to encourage uh, anyone that if they need help and have an educational moment um, where they need some leadership to go through this process, um, it's very helpful. Um, and to find the right counselor or whatever to go through this sort of thing. Um, because really a lot of, a lot of people are, are just stuck you know right well i can only imagine man what you guys have been through the last four years having to live that day in and day out and you know thank god richard uh his health got uh better man that, he gave us a scare man next time i see him i have to kick him in the nuts for that <laughs> <laughs> well, well you know that was that was very scary and just you know since um since wake has happened um it's been you know a decline um you know, from then on. Mm. Um, but this was really scary because um, he really could not, it, it wasn't a matter of inhaling, it was a matter of exhaling. Right. And so, um, you know, yeah, four o'clock in the morning, and I was like, you know what, I'm calling the paramedics, and I don't care what you say. 
<laughs> there you go, man. You yeah. took charge right there, and thank it, you. Thank it, you, it, you yeah. did. It, it is what it is, and uh, got him some help, and gosh, when they put him on life support, I just, you know, I reached out to his attorney, and gosh, I was reaching out to anyone and everyone that I could think of, and uh, I know I reached out to you, and I really appreciate you, and, you know, uh, Rich deserves to be a free man. You're damn right he does. Well, now he's a free man, and now he to go on with life and kick ass. <laughs> give him freak, give him hell. I know, I know. I'm just a new leaf on everything, and I'm just thankful to everyone and anyone that had anything to do with, uh, you know, putting on the pressure. You know. Rock on. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show, hun. And uh, as always, uh, stay in touch with me. We'll. Uh, We'll, uh, we're also going to be kicking uh, numb nuts over at Bikers for Trump in the balls some more, so you'll have fun. Yeah. But uh, he'll wish he uh, answered some of that. But uh, I appreciate having you guys on the show telling your stories. We appreciate you too, James. Thank you so much, Hollywood. Talk to you later, honey. All right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And that was uh, Rich and uh, Danielle. Great people. Uh, Saturday, I got uh, Big O coming up on the show. Uh, you know, a lot of these guys couldn't talk about what happened because uh, they were going through this lawsuit and, or this uh, criminal charges and stuff. And a lot of these guys, uh, you know, I got to give a shout out to the Kazakh one percenters. So a lot of those guys, they stood strong. They didn't freaking hit the uh, the the rat trap or any of that. That's true, uh, bikers right there. Not taking any plea deals or stuff. But uh, keep everybody in their uh, your thoughts that went through this. And uh, after this commercial break, uh, we're gonna have Tombstone up, and uh, he's gonna give uh, a little bit what he thinks. And after that, I'll take a phone call or two. So hopefully you're enjoying the show. It is Monday, April eighth, man. It is uh, nice and warm up here in Illinois, man. I'll be right back. I'd like to invite everyone to check out my new books, The New Age of Biking and Brotherhood, and the number one new release in the transportation history category, Iron Order Motorcycle Club, the year that changed the motorcycle club scene. You will get a no-nonsense look at the current happenings in the scene. Both titles are available on paperback and Kindle through all major retailers as well as an audio version of both of the books on Insane Throttle Publishing. Rock on! Welcome everyone, and thank you Hollywood for allowing me this opportunity. Today we're going to discuss the Twin Peaks Waco, Texas incident from 2015. Now, when Hollywood first came to me with this idea, I was pretty excited. This is a piece of uh, biker history, something that we're always going to remember, and uh, hopefully something that we can all learn from. I was so excited about it, and I started digging through things, and uh, I ended up pouring over hundreds of, of documents and watching hours of video surveillance, interviews, court documents, and then it finally hit me. Uh, when I was done reading everything, it, there was something that just wasn't right. So the event occurred on May 17th, 2015, and again, it will go down in history as one of the worst biker-related incidences that has ever existed. Not because nine bikers were killed that day, which, by the way, could have absolutely been avoided, but because of the blatant attack on the biker culture that has ever been perpetrated. There was so much cover-up and backdoor deals related to ego and stereotypes that nine people died for absolutely no reason. Before we really get into this, I have to start with talking about the clubs that were involved. And I don't mean just the Banditos or the Cossacks, but everyone that chose to choose sides that day. We are our own worst enemies. The motorcycle club culture and biker culture needs to evolve from what we were and become something so much better. We cannot give law enforcement, government, or everyday citizens an excuse to come after us for every little thing that they can think of and try to destroy what many of our brothers before us worked so hard to create and keep alive. This culture is deep 
and rich in history. So much that law enforcement themselves want to be like us. They dress like us, talk like us, ride like us. Well, good luck on the riding part. The bullshit of fighting over a bottom rocker because it represents a territory has proven time and time again to be a complete waste of life. Protecting, having the willingness to die for your colors because you love them so much, because you earned them, because you worked hard for them, and because they mean something to you and your brothers. Well, that's understandable. Just like a soldier's willingness to die for his flag. Protect the culture that you love, not the space you occupy. This culture is not about how much we can accumulate or how much we can take over. It's about the desire to be free and to be rebellious to a system based on control. And here we are becoming the very thing that we fought against since the 40s. If you're in a club and you refuse to get that blessing from the dominant, shame on you. You shouldn't be in this life. You don't know the protocols, you never learned them, and you never learned your history. They are not in place to control like some other people believe they are. They are in place to provide harmony in our culture. So here's what I suggest. Try to fix what you've done. Approach the right people. Apologize for what you've done and show the respect that they deserve. It's really not that hard. Now to the incident and the corruption that's tied to it. So two months prior to the incident that occurred on May 17, 2015, the Texas Department of Public Safety was made aware of an escalation of violence between these clubs. As a warning was put out, by the Texas Joint Crime Information Center, which is basically the intelligence portion of the state police in Texas. On May 1st, 16 days prior to the incident, Jeff Rogers, who was a Waco police detective, uh, sent an email to the administration to notify them that one of his sources tipped him off and the Confederation of Clubs and Independents was holding a meeting at the Twin Peaks in Waco, Texas. Now, mind you, this is six days, 16 days prior. However, even with the two previously mentioned warnings, it seems like the police did absolutely nothing to put an end to it prior to it actually happening. The problem that we have here is you have a lot of people that absolutely think that they know something that don't know shit. And what I mean that is um, there's a group of law-abiding bikers out there, and they like to talk a lot about um, what one percenters are and uh, they're so terrible and all they do is break the law and if you were a member of a 1% club then you didn't expect this to happen, there's something wrong with you. Meanwhile, the ass clown that's making these statements is wearing a three-piece patch that he most likely did not go and get permission to wear by the dominant. So here's what I'm gonna tell you, shithead. If you're wearing a three-piece patch, you're part of it too, buddy. It said, and here's why, because it's said by them that law enforcement uh, wasn't able to shut down the event. Well, I challenge that. I challenge that for this reason. What happened to the term protect and serve? Law enforcement has the authority, the duty, and the responsibility to keep people safe from harm. They could have forced the COC meeting to be canceled based on allegations and information that they already claim to have about the participating clubs and the level of violence in which they're willing to create, which again is alleged. On top of that, the Texas Alcohol Beverage Commission said that they were very confused by the lack of intelligence provided by the Waco PD, stating that it was very uncharacteristic of the Waco PD to not inform them of what was supposed to be happening at Twin Peaks. Why do we say that? Because the ABC could reach out to the franchise owners and up at headquarters and say, hey, listen, there's a problem. This is what we're hearing. You really need to get a hold of your restaurant and make sure that this situation is going to be taken care of and under control. Then we suggest that you shut it down. But that didn't happen. Wake OPD didn't work with the ABC, didn't let them know what was going on, which according to the ABC is kind of a surprise. So what did occur? Well, Wake OPD, they ended up teaming up with the Texas Department of Public Safety. Like I said, they were state police. They uh, got together a couple days prior to the incident and they planned an aggressive surveillance operation which included the following, undercover agents, SWAT teams, and surveillance cameras. If you, if you have SWAT showing up somewhere, you're already aware that there's going to be a problem, okay? 
That's all I'm going to tell you. So you can't tell anybody that you didn't know it was coming. You can't tell anybody that you didn't know that people were going to get hurt because you went aggressively stanced. This surveillance plan was built with contingency plans for every situation. Hostages and tactical movements to overcome barriers to gain entrance to the Twin Peaks if they needed to. Additionally, they developed an evacuation plan for downed officers at the nearest hospital. Downed officers. Nowhere in there did say anything about downed bikers, right? So could Twin Peaks themselves have done anything? Sure. They could have just said, no, we don't want to do the COC meeting here. But let's take this into consideration as well. This was not the first time that the, the Banditos or the Cossacks have been to this specific Twin Peaks. The restaurant even hosted bike nights, which were attended by numerous clubs and independent riders. The Confederation of Clubs and the Independents meeting was scheduled to discuss current laws and restrictions that affect motorcyclists. So why would they have thought that something of this nature would have happened? Approximately 240 bikers and various civilians and families gathered on what looked to be a beautiful, warm, sunny day. At approximately 1225, a, fight, a fight breaks out and a gun is pulled seemingly over a parking spot or a prospect almost getting run over. That's really the only information that we're provided. Um, somebody ends up getting shot in the chest and then law enforcement does something that no law enforcement should ever do and they open fire into a crowd. According to six of the witnesses that were interviewed by the Associated Press, three of whom were military veterans, so they've been through gunfire before. The shootout began with, their statement was that the shootout began with a small number of pistol shots and then was dominated by semi-automatic weapons fire. This is important to remember because only one semi-automatic rifle was confiscated from a biker, which was locked in a car. So where do you think that gunfire came from? In order to go a little bit deeper into uh, the bad things that were going on here, the corruption, let's talk about Abel Reyna, who was the district attorney at the time. Based off the orders from the current district attorney, Abel Reyna, as of 2015, 239 people considered to be bikers were detained and brought to the Waco, Texas Convention Center. Miranda rights were not read to everyone and they were detained and then questioned as well. Ultimately, 177 members and or supporters of either club were arrested and charged with engaging in organized uh, criminal activity, which is a first degree felony, and each person was facing 15 years to life in prison. Abel Reyna gets involved in the investigation, the processing of those detained, and providing direction to Waco PD on how to move forward to ensure that he was able to get a conviction. Anyone that wore patches or had affiliations or supported a specific club was held. Can anyone say biker profiling? A couple weeks later, 22 people are released because there was no evidence to support the case, leaving 155 in custody. Eventually, Abel, Abel Reyna dropped charges against all but 24 of the bikers and re-indicted them on riot charges, which basically is a misdemeanor. So what the hell's going on here? I don't know, but let's jump into the Peabody Wayback Machine and see what's going on. Let's start with a Abel Reyna's father. First of all, Abel comes from a very influential Waco family. His father was elected as the McClellan County District Attorney in the late 80s. Additionally to that, uh, he was also a judge on the 10th Circuit of Appeals. Have you ever met anyone that came from a family where there was a lawyer, a judge, or a DA, or maybe all three, kind of odd, that was not relatively connected or well off? This is where corruption begins, is when you have power. Could this have been Abel's ticket to get to the big leagues? In a statement made by Paul Looney, who is a well-regarded Houston lawyer, he said the district attorney seems to have an egomaniacal need to do something big so he can get his 15 minutes of fame. He wants to do something no one has ever done on a scale that not, has not been accomplished. And in a process, he has tortured the law and he's tortured the facts. The only thing he's accomplished is chaos. If Rain was successful, he would have accomplished something that no other lawyer in the state or federal level has been able to do. Many have tried to accomplish this on a much smaller scale and still couldn't get it done. 
The former DA had absolutely no remorse for anything that had happened that day, no sadness for loss of life, and did nothing but try to put an end to the motorcycle culture in McLennan County. <laughs> so where did he fail? Well, just like any other child, his eyes were bigger than his gut. He inserted himself into an investigation which eventually caused a much larger problem for the overall trial. He tried to keep the stereotype of bikers alive and well by charging them with engaging in organized crime, which he could not prove. The definition of organized crime so that everyone knows as defined by the FBI. The FBI defines organized crime as any group having some manner of a formalized structure and whose primary objective is to obtain money through illegal activities such as groups maintain their position through the use of actual or threatened violence, corrupt public officials, graft or extortion, and generally have a significant impact on the people in their locales, region, or the country as a whole itself. Now, seems to me that the organized crime here is actually the DA's office. And I'm going to tell you why. Because Raina had other issues shortly after this event happened. A federal public corruption investigation was reportedly uh, filed involving Raina dismissing criminal cases for friends and donors of his campaign. So I guess if you have money and you have people with big names, you can get anything you want. A retired Waco police detective, Sherry Kingry, says Reyna and his close friends were organizers of an illegal gambling operation in Waco. And she accused a member of Reyna's staff of searching through the DA's office files and leaking information to members of a suspected auto theft ring. Reyna later dismissed the charges against seven defendants in the auto theft ring, including at least one who was a suspect in capital murder case involving an arson. This guy's out of control. Raina's former first assistant, David, I'm sorry, Greg Davis, also has spoken to the FBI about Raina and his actions and said that in a sworn statement, he has resi resigned his position because he could not abide by the two-tiered justice system that Raina established in his office in which he dismissed criminal cases for his friends and donors. Waco attorney Brittany Scaramucci, a former felony prosecutor, gave a sworn statement in which she also charged Reyna, recused, saying that he recused his office and arranged for a special prosecutor to dismiss cases for his supporters. What does this mean to you? Well, the farce perpetrated onto the biker community that could have been avoided cost the county of McClellan $1.6 million. So what? You don't live there, right? How about nearly $1 million in grants was given to the county to subsidize the cost? Where do you think the grants come from? Taxpayers. The people of the county of Texas, uh, and I'm sorry, the people of the county and the state of Texas and the United States should be shamed of the level of corruption and backdoor deals. The Waco, Texas event was allowed to happen because those that had an opportunity to put an end to it found a way to use it against the biker community. <laughs> The DA that knew this was going to happen organized a deceptive stance against the people of this county and state. This continues today with a high level of biker profiling that is happening today in Texas. Call in now, 312 And there you go. That was uh, Tombstone, man. He laid out the, the case really damn good. What a way to go, Tombstone. You kicked uh, butt on that one. What do you guys think of everything that went on down in uh, Waco, Texas that day? I'll take a call if you have it at 312-899-6720. Uh, I'll give it a couple minutes. If nobody calls in, then we'll move on. But, uh, yeah, this is uh, something that is going to affect the biker community for a long time time coming we're already seeing the residual effects of what is going down in texas and you gotta think to yourself the cops knew everything they were there at seven o'clock in the morning was it their chance to finally put something into action and do what they're doing now to the biker community you know it's funny uh steve cook came up uh earlier in one of the chat rooms now if you guys don't know who steve cook is he is worse than urlacher is okay 
This is a guy who worked a case out in Kansas, and all of a sudden he became the biker guru. He was the biker guru, okay? He went around with this Midwest uh, Biker Gang Association, whatever it's called, and started training police. Now, these people actually paid for his seminars, and the stuff that this guy Steve Cook pushes out, it is hilarious, and it, it, have you guys ever seen the way he looks? He's like some kind of gum. Oh, we got a call coming in. You're on air. How you doing, Washington? Hello? Yeah, you're there. You're on air. Yeah, see, this man, there's, there's a couple things here, man. One of the things that keeps chopping my ass is, is people keep talking about, man, the copper should have done something. The copper should have done something. They should have stopped this, right? But see, at the same time, man, everybody's talking about, you know, the coppers. I mean, you know, the government shouldn't be shouldn't be getting all up in your business and everything. So, <clears throat> why should the coppers have stopped this? No, the coppers shouldn't have stopped this. The fucking outfits should have had their fucking shit together before they showed up. Now, after the fucking shit went down, then the coppers fucked up. They just started sniping motherfuckers off and killing bastards. You know what I'm saying? And well, then the, it got bucked. And then you got this Rena cat that wants to be, I don't know, governor or something. So he's going to do all. And then it got all fucked up. But the whole thing where it went down, that was the responsibility of the outfits, not the coppers. Well, you, you know what? I, well, yeah, I got to. I kind of got to disagree with that. Now, here in Chicago, you know, Say again? I got to. I got to disagree with that. Cops are there. Why? Cops are there. They took an oath to protect and serve. They had, act. You know, actionable intelligence. That's you know, these two clubs weren't getting along. So they were duty bound at that point. They actually were there at seven o'clock. They were actually passing texts to some people in these clubs to go show up and they were egging it down. Now up here in Chicago with the two main clubs, the first thing that always happens at an event if one club's there the other one's turned away so this kind of stuff doesn't happen so well, yeah see, does the clubs well, have see, some is, kind this of is my fucking this is my fucking beef on that where are you going to draw the line on that you say everybody's got free free fucking will you know i mean we're a bunch of fucking motorcycle riders we're going to do what the fuck we want etc cetera, etc cetera. so we're going to do this we're going to do that so then all of a sudden the copper's got to come in to tell us where and what and, and, and et cetera, what we can and we can't do. See, that's my problem there, man. And you're telling me, oh, yes, they can. Yes, the coppers can. Well, that's uh, you know what? That's something that's always been in the clubs. You know, when, this is going back 30, 40 years when the cops knew that one club that didn't like that other club uh, – we're going to be in the same area. They usually got rid of the problem right right away. Now, do, do I think the Kazakh should have been there? No, I don't think the Kazakh should have been there. Okay, because that was so, a confederation so so, media. So the, then the copper should have had a roadblock. So then when the, when the Cossacks went to roll up, then the coppers turned all the Cossacks back? Well, yeah, what you're telling me? the Cossacks shouldn't have been there in the first place, and if the cops knew... Well, that's the Cossacks' fucking business. No, 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 could have been alive today if they actually did their jobs. You know, you can't throw it back on the clubs and all that type of stuff. When they had, those cops were there at 7 o'clock in the morning. They knew well, see, something was going that's down. That's where myself and yourself and maybe a lot of you goddamn listeners are, are going to take, take a goddamn, take a different goddamn path here. Because in my mind, them fucking clubs should have made their own goddamn decisions, should have made their own minds up 
what they were going to do, what was going to go down, and the coppers had no business getting in the middle of that. Now, when the shit went down and the coppers were sitting up on the hill with two with with the fucking ARs popping motherfuckers off in this Rena fucking cat, that's a cool fucking name. What's his name? Rena something other. Fuck, I love that fucking name. Abel anyway, Rena. And, you know, and, and and he probably would have the whole fucking thing up to be honest with you. Oh you know, God, for his political aspirations, and I understand all that. Now, I, I'm 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 there with you about all that. Okay, no no question about all that. But as far as responsibility of what actually went down at that time, man, I'm I, I'm going to catch some fucking slack here, man. That responsibility of what went down at that time, at that moment, is responsibility of the motherfuckers that were there, not the fucking coppers. Well, you know, That's where I'm at. well, that you know, I respect your opinion on that type of stuff. But at seven o'clock in the morning, before anybody even showed up, they were staked out there. Again, going 30, 40 years, everybody knows when two groups don't get along, you break them up. That just like goes to, you know, Black Lives Matter and the Proud Boys, you break them up. No, don't that is the, Black Lives that's, Matter that's the job. Proud Boys on me. That, that's that the shit, job no, don't, of don't, the don't police. Go there. That shit don't fucking cut it, man. It's the oh. same incident. It's the same thing. <laughs> Ah, shit. Okay, I gotta let you go, caller. I got 15 okay, calling Okay, goodbye. Alright, man. Okay, what do you think? Uh, we got New York calling in. Yo, it's Stormstone. What's up? What's up, man? You did an awesome job there, buddy. Holy shit, thank you very much. But listen, this dude, is this guy a cop that was just on? I don't know, man. All I get is a caller ID. <laughs> listen, here's what I'm gonna tell you. It, this is so everybody understands. It's not about if we wanted the cops to be involved and put an end to it or anything else. The whole point of this is people, people's lives were in danger, not just bikers, right? There were civilians, there were families that were in that restaurant that day when this event occurred. Right. So the cops, the cops knew they were there when the goddamn building opened. They were there. They were surrounding the entire building. They, they were armed. They were all in SWAT gear. How are you going to tell me that as a cop, you don't have the, the duty to go in there and protect every one of those people by trying to put an end to this whole thing before it even starts? You're right on right there, man. <laughs> You're right on. You know, and I'll be honest with you. I could give a flying monkey's ass if cops ever get involved in anything that bikers do because we don't want them around. So I hear his point on that. All right. But, you know, you can't say that it's, the, the biker's responsibility because if it was happening on one of their own properties, their own clubhouse, then I'm, I'm like, cool, then it's on them. But mm -hmm. it's in a public location. Yeah, there was kids around and all that kind of stuff, too. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but instead of, instead of the cops doing the right thing and trying to put an end to everything before it escalated in force, they just decided to go ahead and shoot right into the crowd. Right, right. Exactly, man. You're right on, as always, uh, Tombstone. Always on, my man. <laughs> All right, man. I'm sorry. I just had to put my two cents in there. God got me a little hot. I love you, man. Talk to you later, man. You did awesome. All right. Okay. Man, the phone was lighting up today, man. Holy cow. We are going strong, man. If you don't got the number, here it is. Call it now. 312 Okay, man, what do you guys think? Do you think that the cops should have... Oh, here we go. And you are on air from New Hampshire. What's up? Hey, Hollywood. Just calling in. I uh, came a little late into the discussion, but, you know, I think the other really significant, scary part of all this was the lack of due process right off the bat from initiating the investigation. Uh -huh. It was noticed um, in a previous uh, interview, I believe I watched, where they spoke to a previous prosecutor who had worked, I believe, for Dallas County that said, when the incident occurred, you don't arrest all of the people present at the event. You potentially have witnesses, not people that are, that are guilty off the bat. And I think right there, that's suspicious just in the fact of the lack of due process and proper investigative technique. 
going along. Exactly. I don't want to talk to any event like that. <laughs> exactly. You know what? You brought up such a good point. The due process, the Fourth Amendment right there was totally walked on by, you know, these officials down in Texas. You know, yeah, this thing went on, it happened, but to go out there and carte blanche, uh, hand out uh, these uh, papers and say, just fill out a name, that's not the, you know, the kind of justice we have in America. And, and it also biased the fact that I know there's a discussion about, you know, the dominant club that was there and the other club, and, and I, I, I get it. But the other part becomes is how can you even do an unbiased and just investigation of the situation to get to the facts when you don't even go through the due process? It's suspicious right off the bat. And now on the back end, as many people have observed, and it's coming to light, the taxpayers are going to be paying out the butt because of the fact of all the money that went into this, people's lives have been destroyed. They've lost their kids, they've lost their jobs, they've lost things that you can't even measure with a value because of the lack of proper protocol and due process. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely ridiculous. And my question is, you can't put a dollar amount on that, on, on fixing it for those victims of the, of the Waco incident. But, what do you do to hold the people responsible who made the bad decision? And I'm not talking about a mistake. They made a conscientious decision to forego process and rule because they had whatever bias or agenda. How do you fix that? Exactly. And you know what's funny? A lot of people out there say, you know, and Tombstone brought this up. Well, you know, that happened in Texas. What did it have to do with me? When uh, a, uh, a city or a county or a state's on the hook for a, possibly a billion dollars, who do you think's going to be paying out on that? It sure ain't going to stay local. It, it's not. And answer the fact that the repercussions that have trickled down from that event, the, the community went 10 steps backwards, not of their own fault, but because this attitude became amongst the law enforcement community and was, was backed up by this false narrative of, well, all bikers are bad. And, and now we're having to work so hard going uphill to fix that, and it's not right. And I don't know, in the long run, it's what can we take away to improve the situation? I think people need to be held accountable that did illegal activities in the law enforcement and judicial communities. They know what's right and wrong. Exactly. You know what? I couldn't agree with you, you know, a thousand percent. You are dead on. And I really appreciate you calling in. It's awesome to hear from you, New Hampshire. Hot topic well, tonight, let me tell you. Yes, thank you very much, Hollywood. Talk to you later, hon. I had Mac uh, trying to call in. Uh, sorry, guys, man, our phone is just lighting up. It is a freaking hardcore subject tonight, and it should be. We should all, you know, everybody's going to have their opinions and stuff. You know, some might not like one or not the other, but that's what we do here on the Madhouse we debate, and this is a debate going on right now, and uh, what do you guys think of uh, what is happening, and she is so right from New Hampshire, what do we got coming in, we got another one, uh, we got one from Kelly calling in, what's up Kelly? you're on air, oh hey, how's it going, this is Will from Whittier, what's going on, hey what's up buddy, you're on air with the Madhouse, Oh, cool, cool. Um, listen, I'm listening to the show. Great show. This topic is Waco thing, but I like to call it the wacko thing. Uh, it's, it's really intriguing. But um, one thing, if you can clarify or confirm, um, like you had, you had mentioned on the show that the police officers, uh, Waco PD, were were texting. Uh, if if I heard correctly, they were texting the Cossacks and Banditos to show up and you know make peace or or whatnot. And if that's the case, my question is, or if you can clarify why, why were police off, what's going on with police having uh, one percent or numbers, were they checking back and forth? Were these guys informants? Um, a cop would never have my number, so just kind of curious. So I just, maybe I misheard. Can you clarify that? Well, I mean, you know I'll, what? I'll hang up and I'll keep listening to the show if you like. Or No, you're, complete, you're, you're completely right there. Uh, the question is, why the hell did the cops have the numbers? And it has been known that there was uh, informants. Uh, you know, I can't say which club or whatever uh, had the informants, but I know damn well a cop wouldn't have my freaking number. <laughs> yeah, that, that kind of threw me off. I'm like, like, 
like, what the hell? Am I, am I hearing this correctly? But, um, man, that, that's kind of crazy. And if, uh, if the club members uh, find out that these guys were getting messages from cops, that's a red flag. Like, what's going on? Are these guys uh, true brothers or are they, or are they informants? Exactly. You know? But anyway, it's a uh, great show. I'll keep listening. You're the man, man. Thanks, Kelly. And that was California, man. We got all kinds of uh, calls coming in. Everything from the East Coast, West Coast tonight. And uh, this is what I hope continues going forward, that we keep this in the news. I don't care what freaking position you're taking on this. Make sure it stays in the news. Because it don't matter if you're just uh, you know, a clubber or whatever. We got Hold on a second here. We got another call coming in. You're on the air. All right, brother. Hey, this, this is Rich in East Texas, man. I had to call back and just verify that members uh, uh, of law enforcement didn't text anybody. They went through either informants or they went personally, like on the Cossack side, they went personally to the, the uh, president of the Waco chapter mm-hmm. to his place of business and sat down with him and talked to him. And told him, "Hey, you need to be there to, you know, get this worked out." Oh, and okay. uh, and the same, the same thing on the other side. They had connections into uh, the other club, and was kind of saying the same thing. So yeah. there was no texting. They didn't have any numbers that they had that they could text to. Was, was specifically supplied by a, a concealed informant. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, what did you say? Hey, Mac, uh, as soon as I get off the phone with Richard, you can call in, buddy. I know it's lighting up tonight. But uh, what do you think about uh, what the one said about, uh, well, it wasn't the cops' business. It should have been the clubs that stopped it, all that stuff. It pissed me off, man, because he wasn't there. Okay, he's, he's not the one dancing around bullets that cops are shooting at him. And he has no idea what happened 60 days, or in March when they started the investigation uh, into the uh, red and gold and black and gold, and he doesn't know the prior prep that they went through to make this thing happen. Mm-hmm. And so I forgive him for his ignorance, but he's either uh, a, a, a police officer himself or he's never been in a club in his life and he doesn't know what he's talking about. Right, right. Well, I appreciate it. Was, it. It, was the police, it is the police um duty and their oath to protect and serve the public we were all americans there regardless if we had uh, you know identifying jackets or whatever they want to say in the media you know uh, uh, we were americans and they sat there and they picked us off like we were nothing exactly and you know so, what <laughs> i love so. that you call back uh richard to uh clarify that for us because you know there's so yeah, much no that's out there that you know it's hard to pick through and you know you got to listen to the people that were actually there and uh yeah i know we're yeah. having this discussion and stuff like that but uh like i said let's keep this in the news yeah and i just wanted to keep the facts out there because there's nobody that was texting any body from law enforcement to either one of the clubs. Okay. It all had to be done by uh, conf- uh, uh, CIs or face-to-face visits. Rock on, man. I appreciate that, Rich. All right, brother. All right, man. Thanks, man. you Okay, Mac, you can call in, man. I know you've been trying to call in, and uh, the phone is freaking... Uh, Lighting up, man. I, you know, I don't got one of them fancy phone systems that cost a couple thousand dollars where you just stack all the calls. So uh, that's that beeping you're hearing in the background is people trying to get uh, heard on the show. So uh, if you want to come back and call in, uh, Mac, you're uh, welcome to. And I uh, thanks, Rich, for uh, clearing that up because, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't know why anybody, a cop would have a number. Uh, that, you know what? I ain't going to even get in my personal opinions about cops and stuff like that. You know, I want to keep it uh, on Waco. And uh, Mac, you're on air, buddy. How you doing? Hey, man. What's going on? Not a man. How you doing, man? You get any nice honeys lately? It's <laughs> been a hell of a week. Almost a week. <laughs> man. For those that don't know, uh, Mac is one of the uh, 24 that had uh, charges dropped against him, and uh, this nightmare is over for him as well. 
That's right. But you know the the scars are still there. Right. I you know, bet they are, my man. You know, what do you think uh, about some of the that, stuff you've been hearing in the discussion? Well, you know, that guy who called in was to me sounded very silly. Uh, maybe drunk. Mm -hmm. But you know what that we need to remember is I was one of them guys. I lost the visitation rights to some of my kids that I still even can't see right now. Man. You know, I lost a, a thirty-five dollar hour, you know, pop welding job, you know, mm -hmm. over an accusation. Right now, you I've know? known you for going on what over two years now, and the That's shit right. you had to go through. And, uh, you know, everybody says, well, why are you so glad? Because I've got haters out there from the cop side. Well, you know, why are you so oh, glad yeah. that nobody turned? And, you know, you put that patch on and you have to stand for something. It's always been That's that right. way. And you guys over uh, in Waco over, you know, I can't talk for the other clubs and stuff, you know, because I can't yeah. speak for them. But what I do know is uh, the Kazakh one percenters, they didn't go out there and freaking uh, start signing deals and stuff. You guys uh, held out to the very last end. That's right. You know, that's something, you know, that's the oath that we took. And, you know, that's, a long time ago. that's what it used to be in the club scene, because a lot of people say, well, why don't you join a club? It's like, you know, I had my fill back in the days and it's like. It's not the same to me anymore, you know, especially right. doing Insane Throttle, Motorcycle Madhouse. Every day I see it where, you know, supposed brothers are turning on brothers, and it's like, man, no, uh-uh. <laughs> you know, it's not even, you know, you know it's, it's had a black eye for a long time. It's not even cops doing good cop work. It's just they're using snitches to tell on it, to tell on it. Mm-hmm. You know, you got the uh, all the rumors out there. You know, right? Uh, big O is this, you know, chaos is blah blah this. Well, uh, we'll save all that for another, another time. time. But, <laughs> <laughs> gotta let the man have. I gotta let the man have his his uh his moments now that he can finally talk. Man, Big uh, O's been waiting to talk to me forever, man. So he's gonna <laughs> he's got a big show coming up on uh, Saturday, and I'm real happy uh, just, that you guys were able you know, to get through this shit. And you know, and, and it's like all all the gang task force. Well, now we need another gang task force, a new one in Waco, a new one in Houston, a new one in Tyler. For what? You already had it. Y'all had all this intel. Why did you use it? Right. Exactly. I'm not going to say I never seen or knew of any cops texting any of the uh, the our club back then, mm -hmm. and I don't know of any any solid shit where any, that anybody from any other club was sending text messages back and forth. I know that we was in at Twin Peaks mm -hmm. uh, three weeks or a month before at a bot night. That big old and then went to every week, you know, and the cops come up. Talking to, I think maybe it was John Wilson. Man, we heard that there's going to be a problem. Y'all don't need to show up. Hey, man, we ain't here to bother nobody. Right, right. And well, before you go on, you Matt, I, I got to say something. For those that are that are in the chat rooms and stuff like that, the Madhouse is an open forum for debate. Just because somebody don't have uh, the opinion you do, don't deride them. You know, let's keep this as an open debate and let people, you know, this is the only way we're going to keep it in the public eye is to have a debate. You know, we're not the animals right. from the left and the right, okay? We're bikers. We can debate it. And, you know, if you don't have, like an opinion of somebody else's, well, it's their opinion. They get to speak it as well on the Mad Hales. Go ahead, Mac. Yep, you know, and that's just why I wanted to say, you know, the people who wasn't there or the people who – who uh, who are maybe not even in a club? They keep your eyes open because that media, regardless if it's big like mainstream media, or even your local media, they will paint a picture that is so not true. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know. You know. It, it makes me wonder, Mac. Where the hell was the media the last four years? Now they want to jump on the bandwagon that uh, a decision was made. They could have held Reina accountable this whole time. The only one doing it 
was uh, Tommy Witherspoon, Texas Biker Radio, Jim Parks, everybody, you know, yeah, we might not like everybody's coverage, but at least they were talking about it. Where the hell was CNN? Where the hell was MSNBC or CBS? Yeah, man, they were too busy worried about Trump. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? And it's funny that you say that. You know, look what happened in Waco to 177 American citizens. These people Absolutely. are going after the president of the United States. This is the reason why we all better get involved. Exactly. <laughs> Man. You know, we can either we need to come together and uh, figure out a way to let things be mm-hmm. or keep it the way it was and you know, everybody just live in prison. Right, right. Well, you, you, got, know, if you, you don't got evolve, straight. you are doomed to be extinct. You got it damn straight. We live in a time that, and I don't, you know what? I was actually uh, watching, I was up so early today working on the show. I think I was up at like three in the morning. I was watching a review on a Honda Goldwing. Now I was like, holy cow, man. If I age that much where they got automatic bikes, where they got to go and, you know, pander to the younger generation just to get them the ride it is so not like i remember man you know i remember yeah. you used to be able to go out there as a club member you know you know nothing against women and stuff out there but if i wanted to get a side piece of ass i was going out there to get a side piece of ass if you didn't want to get involved then you know wait on the porch and now people will come yeah. back like you know what you're so racist or you're you know you're anti-feminist and it's like what <laughs> and yep. this is coming from bikers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when did that happen? <laughs> if I wanted to get my pole sucked, uh, you know, I thought that was a good thing. But now you got people. Well, I only got one woman, and uh, you know that stuff ain't good. Uh, it's like, dude, do you ride a bike? <laughs> yeah. Hey man, if the life was easy, everybody would do it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but I think a lot of stuff that Tombstone said and a lot of the other guests has said, uh, especially in New Hampshire, well, about, uh, you know, the Fourth Amendment due process, you were there. It was not followed whatsoever. Yeah. Like there, you know, being shot. 20, Big man. 22 minutes, man. I cannot believe yep, that. Yep, out. 22 good man. minutes. All them guys, you know, you know, I know we got the seven from uh, the Cossacks and then we had a civilian and then uh, a bandito. And again, I don't think any of that stuff could have, ha- you know, should have happened that it day. If uh, the, the cops, you know, you know, the situation up in Chicago, the two, the well, the, the main club, the other one is just out there. Uh, but if they showed up at, you know, one was there, the uh, CBD gets your ass out of there right away. And we figured that happens yeah. all over the country, but I guess not in Texas. Well, man, it's a bad day. We all just got to learn from it. And if you ever think that the cops have your best interest, you better think again. Right. <clears throat> exactly. Nobody wanted it to happen like that that day. Well, I can, cops I can bet. They instigated it, and they, and they lit the match. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I appreciate you calling in, man. You tell Big O we're looking forward to his big uh, thing on Saturday. And uh, you guys make sure you keep on partying, man. You guys got four, wor- four years worth of partying to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I will do, man. We'll talk to you soon. Rock and roll, Mac. I'll talk to you later. All right. And that is Mac. And I'll give it a couple more minutes. Uh, let you guys call in if you want. And uh, if not, man, we'll end the show off on that note. But uh, remember, you know, a debate is a debate. And one of the things that you learn and grow is when you debate, you know, people on opposite uh, sides of the spectrum. Yeah, you know, you might get heated here and there, but it is also we're all bikers. We're all in this together. And until we get everybody's opinion molded in the middle, uh, you know, we're not going to keep moving forward with the way these cops are profiling us. Uh, you know, hold on a second. Let me do this. Call in now. 302 All right. 312-899-6220. Or you notice that our show is running a little bit over an hour and a half. 
uh the last show was two hours see i might be on the spring summer schedule now where we go at monday uh at seven o'clock at night and uh saturday at 11 o'clock in the afternoon but or morning i might say but uh that's so we can go around capture all the good stuff come up with all good uh, subjects get the event coverage uh get the correspondence in that way we're giving you at least two uh actually we're four hours a week you know it would be running monday through uh friday anyway but uh with summer season coming up uh yeah we're out there riding the bikes and catching them events because i know you guys just don't want to see me behind a radio uh you know microphone and stuff like that but uh let's see here let's dive back into the chat uh sorry again everybody on facebook you now and all that stuff i am on 30 different platforms going around the world and it is hard to keep up so i stay on my personal channel youtube that way I can see what's going on. But I know you guys, I'll try to respond to you guys on Facebook. You now, VK, my Ruski friends, my Ruski friends out in uh, on VK, uh, Eastern Europe. And uh, our new one in Japan and China. How you guys doing? All our videos will be subtitled in those languages. Right now we concentrate on German, Swedish, Russian, and Spanish. But uh, we'll keep on uh, getting out there the best that we can. So, looks like, uh, you know, that's it about the phone calls. What a lively discussion tonight. And I want to thank everybody for participating in this. It is important that you guys keep this out there. Keep it up. Again, good time, Charlie. If you haven't voted to get or nominated him for the Sturgis Hall of Fame, Go do it. He's the godfather of biker radio. He's out there all the time kicking ass, making sure that the motorcycle in uh, community is out there and thriving. He does a lot of stuff with uh, Sturgis over at, uh, what is it, uh, the Buffalo Chip. And he's got a great lineup on uh, Biker's Inner Circle. Check him out in the morning. Uh, we actually got uh, his stuff going on in... Uh, the outros, I have to get the video in there, but I didn't get it prepared. What about Serbia? You will be able to catch that on VK, I think, uh, Snake. Uh, I don't know. I know that goes on in, uh, in Russia. Uh, I've been wondering, how am I going to find Hollywood at the convention? I will be at the COC convention in Orlando, Florida. Uh, I think it's that Thursday through Sunday, Mother's Day weekend. So if you want to come by, say hi, uh, all that good stuff. Uh, we can. Uh, it's going to be fun time hanging out with everybody. That's why I love getting out from behind the studio and stuff like that. It gets boring here, you know. But anyway, we are now on Instagram. Uh, you'll see some short little videos I got. Don't forget, ask Hollywood on the uh, Thursday at 9. That's where I went out to Sugar River. We answer a few questions. But uh, with that, what a discussion. What a video. What a day. I will talk to you all later. Be careful. And uh, make sure you stay safe, man, because we got a lot of them uh, idiot cagers out there. And don't forget to be watching uh, China Dow on Sundays. And, yes, we will get her to the 20-minute mark. Talk to you guys later. Hi, I'm James Hollywood Machikari. Ask Hollywood is coming every Saturday at 11 o'clock Central Standard Time. Do you have a question that you always wanted to ask me? Send it in. Info at InsaneThrottleBikerNews.com Don't forget to have that prospect hit the subscribe button and that bell in the upper right hand corner so you will always be up to date with the new channel content. Hi, this is James Hollywood Machikari with Motorcycle Madhouse and I'm here to tell you about the hottest new custom sign business out there, Extreme LED Signs by Jim Vanderlane. Extreme's LED signs specialize in bike club signs, sports signs, business signs, and a whole lot more. Custom crafting by a biker, Jim, he puts his all into whatever project you would like him to do. Visit him on Facebook or give him a call at 585-509-0522. Again, that's 585-509-0522. Rock on! Hey, 
Hey, this is Ruben Roman. Yep, big the boy in the Cycle Tribe Chronicles. Hey, this is Ruben Roman. Yep, big the boy. Yeah. Twenty years later, seven albums and the same amount of tours, and and here I am, man. Thanks for watching Motorcycle Madhouse Live. We're on Monday through Friday from 7 to 7.30. Check out some of these videos of our archives. Get to know us. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. We appreciate all your support. We'll see you next time.